Next up, we have Sean Martin speaking to us from Trinity College in Dublin. And his talk is on the analysis of interregional connectivity at the single cell level. Uh, so take it from here, Sean. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean, and I'll be presenting some joint work with John Eagleton and Shane O'Mara at Trinity College Dublin and Carnegie University. So yeah, we'll be roughly looking at the probability of recording anatomically connected neurons in multiple interacting brain regions. And the real motivation for this is that there's these amazing huge data sets being recorded at the moment where they've numerous neurons in multiple brain regions uh, being recorded by Allen Institute, Janela, Brain, we're talking about it yesterday that these sort of hero data sets might take decades to analyze, but it's the kind of thing we're thinking about. Um, and really what we think is that the correlations and the patterns the basis for this should be the structural connectivity. In, in theory, in some sense, it must be. So that's what we're looking at here. To put the problem quite roughly, if you've got two brain regions and you sample a bunch of neurons randomly in the two, um, such as these gray ones here, you could get them randomly, what proportion of them would you expect to be connected? So for here, example, seven is connected to G by direct connection. And so if you scale it up to a bigger network, such as a thousand neurons in both regions, which is still orders of magnitude less than would be in a real brain, but gets the point across, uh, hopefully for an illustration, if you were to take say 20 randomly here and here, how many might be connected or in this kind of network, many different kinds of networks. And so when you look at this and you want to solve this problem, what you need is you need some kind of recipe of explaining what the connectivity between the two regions you're looking at is. Here, for example, we have a full connectivity matrix from the blue brain model of the mouse neocortex. Um, but it could be anything, any kind of recipe that says how forward connections between the regions are, what current connections are like, what local connections are like. You just need some sort of recipe. And then when you have that, you turn it into a statistical model so that you can say, OK, if we sample x neurons here and y neurons here, how many of them might be connected to each other and along what kind of paths? So to do this, we look at, say, take this graph here. You want to do some computer simulations of it first for accuracy purposes. So you just literally over and over again take a handful of neurons on one side randomly and a handful on the other randomly. And you get a distribution by simulating there. And you compare that to the distribution from your statistics. So here, for example, it's taking 20 in both regions. And the probability mass function matches quite well. There's some small differences um, for sure. But the overall shape is similar. And more importantly, the mean is very similar. Um, you can see that again if you take different numbers of samples. So we take, say, five in each region and so on. It matches quite well. And here there's a distinction. Um, the blue line is indicating that these neurons that you sampled randomly have to be directly connected. The orange one is saying that they don't have to be directly connected. They could be, but they can also communicate through one other neuron. And similarly for the, the green is through two other neurons. Uh, but that matches quite well overall. And you can do that for different kinds of networks, different kinds of connectivity, different brain regions, just a few samples here. But overall, the, the expectation tends to match quite well. And if you apply that to some real data, for example, well, real is in uh, kind of the best we're looking at at the moment, perhaps, with the blue brain model again of the, the mouse neocortex. Uh, here, we're just taking primary motor cortex area to the primary somatosensory area associated with lower limbic function. And you take different numbers of samples in those regions. So down here, you might be looking at maybe a tetrod in both. Up here, you're looking at maybe a neuropixels probe in both. And you're just trying to ask the question of how does the proportion of connections grow with the number of samples you're taking. So for direct, it's roughly linear. For them being able to communicate through one of the neurons, so two synapses, it's roughly exponential. And with three, nearly everything is connected, just because these local connections back here are so vast. Um, and then you can do that for lots of different brain regions. Here's just a few examples. Uh, we already mentioned this one just there. You could do the reverse, reverse direction, so somatosensory to motor instead of motor to somatosensory. You could look at primary visual area to lateral visual area and in the reverse direction. And in this case, we're just taking 79 samples in both of those brain regions, which is the average of a neuropixels probe. Um, so to conclude, um, the statistical estimate that we have here is fast. It's much faster than simulating these networks. It takes a really long time to have to get these individual neurons and see if they're connected. Um, it's quite accurate. We're in the process of quantifying how accurate. As you saw, there's small differences in the probability mass function. 
And some of that comes from how many iterations you do, some of its other factors. Um, we do have a large limitation that we're not considering topography, by which a NeuroPixels probe actually is a linear shaft, and you would expect all the neurons you sample to kind of be in a line, whereas we're just taking 79 neurons kind of just randomly everywhere. We're not considering space. Uh, so that is a big limitation. Um, and dynamics is also not considered. We're just taking a static network. We're not considering synaptogenesis or anything like that during your recordings. But in the future, we do hope to try and think about how this could be applied to large data sets. Uh, one example, just as a kind of to think about might be, say you noticed a very high correlation between two brain regions in these big data sets that people are recording. Uh, the neurons tended to spike well together. And this also showed that they're very highly likely to be well connected. Perhaps that's indicative of those two regions may be driving each other as opposed to being driven by an external region or by overall oscillations in the brain. Um, but that's obviously for, for future thinking. But that's me. Uh, thanks very much for listening to the talk. Uh, you can find us at these email addresses and websites. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and thanks again. Great talk. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Thank so we're open for questions. Um, I guess I'll start off. I was, you, so you said that you, you set up that, that algorithm to determine the number of connections effectively. So what are the, the caveats that you would expect could be uh, taking place? So you're happy to have the same mean number of connections, but what would be, what would be possibly going wrong? Yeah, I, I think really what's going wrong is uh, kind of to back to the topography limitation. I think really, you know, if you take a tetrod and you take, say you got five neurons that they're all kind of in a small ball, they're not reaching out properly to the rest of the neurons in the brain the same way the the five we're just taking kind of, you know, we don't have space like the blue brain model or the recipe. You could kind of try to infer space based on doing, um, like if you take the network and you try and do forces, maybe modeled as like a spring particle system to, you know, maybe guess what space is, but it's not uh, fully in the model. So we're, we're really missing out on space, I think is the, the real thing that could be going wrong. Yeah. Other questions? Um, and you said, so you wanted to infer the number and also the kind of path. What did you mean by that? Um, yeah, by kind, I, I just meant, um, does it go, is it a direct connection? Is it through one other neuron, say, to help the, to like to finish the communication? Is it true to, um, we're not considering excitatory or inhibitory. For example, you could set it up with only excitatory neurons in this or inhibitory. Um, by type, I just meant length of path, sorry. Cool, yeah, yeah, I see, so disynaptic, trisynaptic. Yeah. And, and uh, specifically to this, you were mentioning, um, I didn't quite get your graph where you were saying that if you have disynaptic, we get more connections and trisynaptic, we basically are all connected. Uh, could you maybe expand on the implications of this? Yeah, so this is, um, this is, oops. Um, basically what we're, what we're just saying here is that now this is for, um, we do have results for like the kind of blue brain model as well. This is more for this kind of toy example. But um, really what we're just saying is that if you're trying to look for directly connected neurons in these kind of recordings, it's still, if we go to the blue one, it's still gonna be pretty low chances. Um, but if you're willing to consider maybe a kind of a lower influence of neurons on each other, then you will see with these, um, you know, larger recordings that there's a lot of influence between these neurons that you're recording. Um, yeah, okay, so if, you, if your technique for uh, spotting a connectivity uh, is agnostic as to the number of synaptic jumps beyond, beyond three, you basically should see full connectivity. That's what you're oh, saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and of course, topography is still, the limitation of space is still there. So it's the one thing we kind of have to look at, but even I think at that, if you're taking four uh, synapses, that I think even with space as a consideration, you're still nearly everything is is going to be connected. 
Wow. Or at least as long it as goes, there's connectivity. It goes pretty quickly. Like, is that for the blue brain or that's for your? Yeah, that's blue that's for blue brain. Between uh, it's for this one here. Um, huh. Oops, I'm going the wrong way in my slides. Um, no, it goes really quickly. We didn't expect it. So the connectivity, um, the, the the basic connectivity between the excited three neurons in there should be something like five percent, right? Yeah, but it just it it basically explodes so quickly when you allow like even though we were surprised too, and I'm still kind of to some sense coming to the ramifications of that because I, I set out with this project almost to be like ah we're doing great with neuropixels but it's still not enough and then I went whoa actually uh, as long as you're not looking for direct it kind of nearly is enough um it's just the local connections like even I, this is uh, obviously averaging over a lot this um these are 150 e each right. one of these squares is 150 by 150 neurons averaged for their uh, number I like how many of them are connected the percent but uh Regardless, these local connections, even as you say, there's not that many of them, but it just explodes when you allow. Um, it's kind of surprising. Yeah, no, I'm still kind of coming to the ramifications of that, to be honest. <laughs> we have a question here from Sebastien Maillet, uh, whom I actually know, uh, who says, uh, well, th first, thanks for the great talk. And he says, uh, do you think that your analysis could also help to improve the interpretation of retrograde and anterograde labeling studies with smaller data sets? Yeah, possibly. It's definitely something we're thinking about. It's um, it's it's really something in mind, especially uh, John Agleton um, does a good bit of work in this in this field. So it's something in mind. I would love to give you something more concrete than that, <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure, um, to be fully honest. And what are the MOP and SSP? Uh, so MOP is primary motor cortex is MOP and SSPLL is the somatosensory, mm. primary somatosensory area associated with lower limbic function. It's the labels okay. from Blue Brain Zone. Institute. Uh, yeah. Blue Brain in this case, yeah, yeah. Uh, same for Alan really, yeah. That's all my questions. Um, any other questions from the audience or from the panelists? If not, we would switch to our next Thanks. speaker. You, Thank you so much, Yishan.